Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome to another one of our webinars. And today we're going to dive into the world of rotary tuning. We're going to cover some of the basics, some of the fundamentals of rotary tuning. And we'll have a few live demonstrations of the aspects that I'm talking about as we go on our mainline Pro Hub Dyno. Rotary tuning information is something that we have been asked about for just about as long as we've been in business. And it's something that we've been trying to bring out. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we purchased and built up this FD RX7 project car. It sort of coincides with the launch of a full worked example using the FD RX7 on the Adaptronic Modular Series ECU. If you do want to learn more about that and see the HPA 10 step process being applied from start to finish, that is already available in the worked example library in our practical standalone tuning course. However, today we are going to still go over some of those fundamentals. So if you've watched that, that worked example some of this will be uh, already covered but uh, we're going to go into a few other aspects as well interestingly despite the fact that clearly the rotary engine works on a completely different operating principle to the piston engine we actually find that the rotary engine in general responds in a very similar way to both fuel and ignition timing uh, compared to a piston engine so that's good because everything we learn in the likes of our EFI tuning fundamentals and our practical standalone tuning course does still apply to the rotary engine but of course there are some caveats and that's really what we want to focus on today before we dive in too deep, I just want to give you a bit of a rundown on the car itself if you don't know anything about this. So we'll jump across to my laptop screen and this is the angle that uh, is a little bit difficult to show you on the webinar. Uh, so the car itself is a low kilometre Series 7 RX7 and it is still fitted with the stock 13B engine. Uh, however, uh, the areas that we're focused on are modifying the inlet airflow and outlet so that's of course the turbo kit here uh, so we are running a Borg Warner EFR 8474 turbocharger this is mounted to an investment cast stainless manifold from Turbloan Engineering uh, it's also running a Turbloan exhaust system as well so basically the entire kit was sourced from Turbloan uh, this is also fitted with a pair of turbo smart external wastegates but problematic in the FDRX7 chassis because uh, in stock form the turbine kit has these dumping to atmosphere. We can't do this road legal in New Zealand so it's quite an intricate exhaust system uh, that plums those all the way to the rear of the car. Uh, the EFR 8474 turbo, a little bit difficult to see here but also incorporates a built-in recirculating valve that's been swapped to a turbo smart valve. So that's the uh, turbo side. Now uh, on paper all in that turbo is probably good for somewhere between eight and 900 horsepower. Uh, suffice to say that's a long way ahead of where we intend to go with this stock low kilometer 13B and uh, this really ties in quite nicely to one of the assets we're going to talk about which is rotary reliability and keeping our power targets uh, under control. So uh, while we are running the stock 13B we're going to be targeting around about 400 wheel horsepower at the most and that should be something we can achieve on relatively low boost pressure somewhere uh, in the vicinity of about 15 psi. Some other upgrades there, a horrible shot but uh, hopefully you can sort of see what's going on. We've got a CJ Motorsports uh, fuel rail kit, so that's for the primary and the secondary there. Uh, converts to the more common EV14 style uh, top feed injector uh, for this particular build. We're using a set of ID1300 primaries and ID1700 secondaries. Uh, one of the reasons, it's probably overkill for a 400 horsepower at the wheels build but we do want to end up running flex fuel on this. Now in this shot here as well a little bit hidden but we have uh, upgraded the factory waste spark ignition system to a set of individual direct spark IGN 1A coils so pretty uh, normal stuff there. Uh, I have talked about this in a lot of our webinars before but uh, for those who are new to it we have also taken the opportunity to convert uh, this particular 13B to drive by wire throttle. Uh, a little bit unique there are some kits on the market that allow this to be done using a GM style throttle body uh, which mounts to an adapter basically up in place of the stock throttle body. Uh, I didn't want to do that because the stock 13B uh, inlet manifold actually runs uh, primary and secondary runners essentially with three butterflies. It's quite a unique throttle body arrangement and the primary and secondary butterflies are actually staggered very slightly in their opening. So I wanted to retain that uh, 
maybe not strictly necessary but I wanted to do it anyway so we've converted to drive by wire using a BMW S54 drive by wire motor uh, that is mounted down here so you can see that little push rod down here on the air conditioning bracket so that's basically the hardware aspects actually if we just pop back for a second uh, also uh, for supporting modifications there we've got a front mount or V mount I should say uh, intercooling radiator setup which was hand fabricated by Vinifab here in New Zealand so it's basically the uh, in and outs of everything so nothing particularly extreme uh, particularly given that we are running the stock engine there uh, in terms of the ECU we are running the Adaptronic Modular ECU with a full mil spec wiring harness so that's what we've got going on there so let's talk for a start about uh, rotary reliability and we hear uh, a lot of people talk about how unreliable the rotary engine is. Uh, some of this is justified and some uh, really is a little bit unfair. I, I think one of the problems that I've seen in my entire career uh, with the attitude that a lot of rotary owners have Definitely not all of them, but a lot of rotary owners think that the rotary engine is simple. Remember, the rotary engine has less moving parts than a piston engine. So we get this uh, impression that rotary engines are simple and therefore anyone can uh, strip apart and rebuild their rotary engine in their back shed. Now that's not to say that that isn't the case and yes clearly there are less moving parts than a piston engine but the rotary engine still demands the same level of respect that you would apply to building any engine. So we see a lot of people rebuilding the engine without really a good understanding of what goes into it uh, using subpar parts or parts that really should have been replaced and of course when you're building an engine with uh, second hand parts that maybe aren't assembled with the precision that they should be the end result is pretty much uh, guaranteed. Now this is sort of made worse because a lot of rotary tuners or I should say a lot of tuners who are getting into rotary tuning don't understand the intricacies of rotary tuning, that's what we're going to be talking about today so don't worry, uh, and they try and treat rotary engines the same way you would treat a piston engine. Now news flash here rotary engines they're not piston engines there are some differences and we do need to understand these and apply the right techniques now if we do that though we're going to end up getting good results and there is no reason why a rotary engine can't actually provide uh, a long and healthy service life if we do understand the implications so uh, as usual I should mention as well we will have uh, questions and answers at the end of the lesson so if there's anything that I talk about that you would like me to dive into in a bit more detail. Uh, anything else related to the topic of rotary tuning then please ask those questions in the chat and we'll jump into those at the end. Uh, let's start by talking about one of the biggest differences between rotary engines and piston engines which is our rotary fuel mixture targets. Uh, so this is really important because rotary engines do tend to run richer than a uh, comparable piston engine making the same amount of power or well, uh, we tend to need to run them richer I should say. So uh, let's start, what we'll do is we'll just get our engine up and running here on the dyno and we'll head over to my laptop screen and we'll have a look through the Adaptronic software. Uh, so while today we will be focusing on the Adaptronic software, basically uh, everything that we're going to talk about today will apply to just about any aftermarket standalone ECU uh, that is used on a rotary engine. So we've got the engine just up and running here, this is our main VE map or fuel map here, it is a volumetric efficiency based ECU. Uh, while I've been talking the lambdas come online here so uh, I will apologise to those who prefer to work in air fuel ratio units but today we will be working in lambda units. So we can see that uh, we've got our lambda sitting right about 0 0.90 at the moment, 0 0.89, uh, target there 0 0.92, 0 0.918, let's round that, 0 0.92. So the first thing there is that for a stock non-ported rotary uh, that's a reasonably rich target you would think, particularly if you've come from a piston engine background, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for a stock piston engine to be targeting uh, somewhere around about lambda 1, st the stoic air fuel ratio at, uh, at idle good fuel economy is going to come from that, good uh, tailpipe emissions as well. So let's have a look at our target lambda table here and we'll see uh, what we've got going on here. Uh, so we've got that graphically represented up here uh, numerically down below so we've got a three dimensional table we've got our inlet manifold uh, pressure on the vertical axis there and we've got our RPM on the horizontal axis uh, 
just to point out here the load increases as we go from the top to the bottom of this table so our 100 kPa area here uh, this is actually our atmospheric pressure so first of all target idle here we can see we're at about 0.92 which is exactly what we saw there so we do generally find that the rotary engine is going to want to run richer at idle uh, you're going to struggle to get good quality idle uh, at lambda one particularly if it's ported you're most certainly going to need to be richer so that's our first consideration there and you can literally play with the idle mixture and see the effect of that mixture on the idle quality as you lead it out towards lambda one it's going to be starting to hunt it's not going to run smoothly and it's going to start stalling so we really want to run a mixture basically as lean as we can make it where we've still got nice smooth control of our idle now we can see that we've got this chunk in the table here between about 60 kPa and 0 kPa 2.5 to 3,500 RPM where we are targeting lambda 1 and this is important because this is a road car so it's not a dedicated race car it's not going to see a lot of time on the racetrack and we want to get reasonable fuel economy so this is one of those compromises the problem with rotary engines is that they do tend to run hotter than a piston engine and this is affected by our air fuel ratio targets as well uh, this is one of the reasons that when we get into our wide open throttle full boost area we need to be richer again uh, but lambda one there it's going to give us good fuel economy but it is going to result in higher exhaust gas temperature so we're just going to have a quick look at that i'll just get ourselves up and running here on the dyno get our fan operating and what we'll do is we'll come up to 3000 rpm if i don't stall it would probably be a good start so we'll come up to 3000 rpm and cruise so this is an area that we would be operating uh, quite frequently at cruise so you can see we are operating with our lambda target at lambda 1.0 uh, we can see we're actually just a touch leaner than our target but we're a little bit heat soaked so as everything comes right we can see we're there or thereabouts sitting at lambda 1. Interesting thing is uh, now it's mislabeled here but this particular parameter that I've just highlighted over on the right hand side it says 0 to 5 volt external 1 and percent this is actually an exhaust gas temperature sensor so we've got one of these in each runner and we can see that while I've been talking here it's still coming up I'm still at constant throttle we're only at 48 kPa we're in vacuum I'm barely touching the throttle here we're at about 18 percent uh, pedal position and we're almost at 800 degrees C so that's quite hot now if we come back to that particular cell here uh, let's just target 0.85 lambda it is a VE based ECU so it might not track perfectly and it hasn't but we've gone from lambda 1 down to 0.9 so we're there or thereabouts again uh, so we can see that our EGT has dropped we're dropping down into the 770s now from what we were previously running so the first thing to understand there is our relationship between exhaust gas temperature which is ultimately combustion chamber temperature and our lambda the leaner we run the air fuel ratio towards stoic uh, the hotter our combustion charge and exhaust gas temperature is going to become so we need to manage this and be a little bit sensible now I can get away with this down in this particular area of the table here uh, because we're at such light load so we're not combusting a lot of fuel and air inside the rotary engine engine anyway and this is where we're trading off our combustion charge temperature or EGT uh, for good fuel economy really important consideration for a road engine now interestingly what you will see in this VE table though sorry this uh, air fuel ratio target table is once we go up above 4000 rpm I've tapered that richer again we're back to 0 0.95 if this was a race engine uh, I'd quite likely go even richer so the idea here is if we're four four and a half thousand rpm and above and we're operating in this area uh, generally that's going to be indicative of the fact we are in overrun so we're either completely off the throttle under brakes uh, or alternatively we've closed the throttle on a gear shift and what I'm doing here is purposely targeting a little bit richer than what would necessarily be 
required uh, with the idea here that we're going to be passing some additional fuel through the rotor housings in order to help uh, draw a little bit of temperature out of them. So this can be quite beneficial particularly for a competition race engine where it's going to be beaten on hard lap after lap. So uh, again we can monitor what's happening with our exhaust gas temperature and the air fuel ratio targets we use in those overrun areas to help with this. Uh, if you are going to use this sort of trick then obviously it should go without saying that disabling the overrun fuel cutoff uh, is going to be required otherwise when you are in those areas and you're completely off the throttle then the injection will be disabled. So uh, again, focus here is uh, basing your decision on what you need to achieve. Uh, obviously, if you were worried about uh, emissions, then that's not going to be a great thing, which is one of the reasons why OE manufacturers tend to use uh, a deceleration fuel cut. All right, let's go back to our table though and have a look at our other results here or our other targets. So 100 kPa here, we can see at the moment I'm running 0 0.90. So on a piston engine that was turbocharged, I'd probably be more likely to be maybe 0 0.95, maybe even 0 0.98 in this area. We're only transitioning on the two boost. We don't have a lot of load. We can probably get there with no more than about 20 to 30 percent throttle. So uh, again, a little bit richer. Now for this particular engine here, uh, I am targeting a maximum boost of 200 kPa, let's call it 15 psi in round numbers. Uh, so we can see this is the area we're going to be running through and I've got a nice flat across the board 0.76 lambda target. Now again, for a comparable piston engine, I'd probably more likely to be in the region there of 0.78 uh, on the rich side probably more likely 0.80 or thereabouts maybe even 0.82 uh, so we're around about four or five percent richer at this point than what we'd run on a comparable piston engine uh, as we move down further though not that I'm expecting to get to these areas on this particular engine uh, we can see that we continue to move richer and uh, for those who really can't handle uh, lambda units let's just have a quick look at that uh, so we can see that 240 kPa 20 psi were uh, 10.9 to 1, then we run 10.6, 10.3. Again, uh, I'm not expecting to need to run these air fuel ratios because we're not in that particular uh, boost target. So uh, one of the factors that we quite often hear is the air fuel ratio targets that people tuning rotary engines are uh, quoting are exceptionally rich. And yes, we do need to run a little bit richer than a piston engine, but generally I err away from the side of the excessively rich mixtures that some people talk about. Uh, I hear a lot of rotary tuners basically any turbocharged engine uh, they're straight away 10.5 to 1 or richer and you can see there my target was basically just sitting on 10.9 11 to 1 uh, what we will find is that if we richen the air fuel ratio from there what we're going to end up finding is that we will start to see our power drop off quite dramatically so what we what we end up with is kind of a, a curve it's almost like our MBT timing curve which we'll look at shortly and what we want to do is make sure that we're basically at the point where our power has just started to drop off a little bit with our, our richer mixture but before we actually fall off the cliff and that's going to uh, help control uh, our combustion charge temperature. All right, so that's our first aspect there we've had a quick look at our rotary air fuel ratios. Uh, the next aspect that we're going to talk about here is our rotary ignition timing and there's a few aspects that sort of uh, go hand in hand with our ignition timing that we need to understand. Uh, this is probably the area where I think most people go wrong and most people do damage. So uh, the first place to start here is understanding how to set our base ignition timing. Uh, so what we can do here if we go to our inputs and to our triggering, so triggering is up here and again this is specific to the Adaptronic ECU but just important to understand what's going on here. Uh, we have a function here called timing lock enable so at the moment we can see it says no timing lock and that's important because we are running a normal timing map. If we open this up we can see it we can timing lock normal we can set timing lock normal uh, or timing lock rotary. 
would make sense here that we use the rotary option. So uh, it's important to understand what that will do. So if we use timing lock normal, this is conventionally for piston engines and what it will do is set the timing to a fixed value uh, of whatever our base angle is. Uh, so we can set that up here. Uh, with the timing lock rotary it will set the uh, leading to minus 5 and the trailing to minus 20 which might seem like strange numbers but there is a method to Adaptronics reasoning behind that so uh, if we just this is the timing uh, pulley on the front of the FD RX7 or 13B REW engine and uh, so it's a crank trigger system we can see here there is a little divot in the pulley and this is our timing mark and that coincides with this mark that is on the front cover of the engine. Uh, when those line up the timing there is minus 20 degrees, so 20 degrees after TDC. So remember uh, the timing, the rotary timing mode for the Adaptronic sets the leading at minus 5 and the trailing at minus 20. So if we're doing a series 6, 7, 8 engine with that timing mode, if we time off the trailing then we should see this little mark here coincide with this little guy here that should mean that our timing is correct on the other end on the other hand if you just let me get back to my notes for one second here I'll find the other aspect that I wanted to show you uh, right if we go across to my laptop screen uh, on the earlier rotary engines uh, there were two timing marks on the pulley and a single pin so uh, the timing marks here uh, there was a mark at five degrees after top dead center which was a yellow mark and there was a second mark at 20 degrees after TDC which is the red mark so it's really important probably this is rule number one of rotary engine tuning setting the base timing is just as critical as any engine just as critical as a piston engine we want to make sure that the timing that the ECU is delivering is the same as the timing uh, sorry that the ECU is delivering is the same, same as the timing uh, that the engine is actually receiving if we have got the timing light pointing at the crank pulley uh, but this requires understanding what those marks actually mean so it's going to depend of course there what generation of a rotary engine you are tuning if you were on the earlier uh, series 4 or 5 for example with the two timing marks there if you used the timing mode from the Adaptronic, uh, we could go onto the leading plug that should fire on the leading mark. The trailing plug should fire on the trailing mark because remember it sets it to minus 5 and minus 20 degrees. However, that's a little bit trickier with the Series 6, uh, Series 6, 7, 8. So we've only got that one timing mark. So remember that's going to be minus 20 degrees. So there's two ways we can do this. As I mentioned, we can set uh, the we can time it off the trailing plug. I like to not take any chances though. I like to check the timing on the leading and the trailing. So what we can do there uh, is use the rotary mode. Time off the trailing should coincide with that mark. Come back into our Adaptronic ECU. If we select the timing mode as timing lock normal, uh, we can then set a base uh, angle that uh, we will be able to actually see on the rotary front cover uh, for our leading plug, so minus 20. Now, the thing is, the engine isn't going to run particularly happily when we are doing this so it's important here to or it's helpful to use uh, someone to sit there and actually manually bring the RPM up and hold the RPM up while you're actually checking that timing and making sure it's okay. Other key thing is that once you've done that uh, you do want to make sure that you come back and turn your timing lock off uh, because I'll just go to timing lock normal here and it's going to going to uh, stall so that's what we get the ability to see here is our timing lock angle when that timing lock is set to on so I've got that at minus 20 because I was doing my leading plug uh, now once we've done that we want to come up here and if there is a discrepancy between the timing we're seeing with the timing light and the timing that the ECU is requesting in this case minus 20 we're going to adjust that with our base angle value there and then again as I mentioned turn our timing lock off now not such a big deal with uh, that particular configuration because as you saw the engine's not going to run very happily at minus 20 degrees but if you're using another value where the engine will run uh, you're going to end up with very retarded timing values it's going to create a lot of heat in the exhaust system 
system in the combustion chamber and you're also going to wonder why the engine isn't actually responding to your tuning changes like you'd expect. So that's our first aspect there, understanding what the timing marks are so that we can properly set our base ignition timing. Now let's have a look at the timing map that we've got here and we'll come into our ignition timing map and a lot of ways the numbers we see here are quite similar to a piston engine but we do want to be really mindful of uh, the numbers we're using because too much timing can easily cause detonation in the rotary engine which is in my opinion probably the number one killer. It's a good time to just talk about knock detection on rotary engines. There are a lot of tuners that out there who uh, do use knock detection on rotary engines uh, and I'm talking here about closed loop knock control more than audio knock detection. I'm not a big fan of this. The reason that I don't use it is because in order to set up and validate closed loop knock control we need to actually make the engine knock. We need to induce some level of knock so that we can find out uh, what the knock threshold needs to be and what the knock frequency is. The problem with a rotary engine, particularly a stock one with stock seals, is almost any level of detonation can actually damage the engine. So uh, basically what I'm saying is we're going to almost like, most likely end up doing damage while we're setting that up. So conservative numbers here are the aim of the day and staying away from knock. That is why I don't believe in knock control on a rotary engine. I do typically still use audio knock detection while I am tuning the rotary engine. Can give you a bit of a safeguard, you might get a bit of a get out of jail free card if you do hear something occurring and you can get out of the throttle quick enough but most instances the engine's going to be damaged before we really get a chance to react. So let's have a look at the relationship here between our ignition timing and our engine torque. It's a little bit tricky to do but let's get ourselves up and running here and we'll see if I can do a good enough job of this. So what we'll do here is we'll bring up our torque optimization test. Uh, now I am straddling a few cells here so what I'm going to do is set all of the cells there to 10 degrees. Now just while I'm doing this, before I get started, I just want you to watch back on my laptop screen for a moment here, hopefully I haven't thrown Luke under the bus, that with that 10 degrees timing, you can see that our exhaust gas temperature is skyrocketing. Still coming up, 960 degrees, so I'm just going to clear this and get going. And what we're going to do here is just going to advance the timing at a degree every second or thereabouts. And we're going to go all the way through from 10 degrees through to 45. And hopefully I'm going to be able to do a good enough job of staying stable on the throttle here so we get a nice relationship between our torque and our ignition timing. So as I'm coming up through 27 degrees at the moment, now you might not be able to see this on my laptop screen at the moment, but our exhaust gas temperature has dropped. We've gone from 860 where we started down to 820. So we're coming up through 32, 34, 35 degrees now. And we're going to go all the way through to 45 here. And it's not the best graph unfortunately, which is a shame, but back off and we'll talk about it. So first of all if you've ever seen me do one of these for a piston engine, uh, the general trend, the general shape of that graph is still the same. However what we can take away from this is that the piston engine is a little bit more sensitive to ignition timing than a rotary. Uh, here we've gone from let's say 110 pound foot of torque uh, at 10 degrees through to about 185. Uh, so we've picked up about 70 odd, 75 uh, pound foot of torque. Uh, so not insignificant don't get me wrong. Uh, a little bit of this though, this isn't actually quite the shape I was hoping to be able to show you. Very difficult to do this uh, repeatedly and accurately because it does rely on staying so uh, carefully in the centre of the cell which is unfortunately I haven't quite done there. So generally what we'll find is that this would have probably tapered off somewhere around about 28 degrees, flattened off and then right at the top end uh, we would have plateaued and fallen away. So uh, we've artificially just increased this unfortunately not staying quite smack bang in the middle of the cell. So generally what we see with the rotary engine is the shape of this curve is just a little bit flatter than a piston engine. And what this means is that we don't want to be chasing torque and power uh, using timing with the rotary engine like we can with the piston engine. 
festival one, it's not as necessary. We're not going to need to do that to make every last kilowatt or uh, horsepower out of our engine because of that relationship. And two, the rotary engine very insensitive to knock. So uh, again, I haven't drawn the best diagram here but let's say uh, we would have plateaued generally around about 28 degrees uh, and we would have seen that from about 21 22 degrees through to about 28 degrees uh, we really wouldn't see much more than a couple of percent uh, change in our power and torque and that's kind of the area that we want to be setting our timing so as we're increasing our timing and we're seeing the torque uh, increase and then start to drop away the, the, the increases aren't getting so big we're only seeing maybe uh, one or two pound of torque for every degree of timing. It's the time to stop and sort of think to yourself, well, look, uh, it's not really responding anymore, so let's be a little conservative and we'll leave ourselves just to the left of MBT. We don't want to be chasing uh, peak timing, uh, MBT timing like that. Uh, now the other aspect there is uh, a lot of people think okay well I'm going to be super conservative on the timing and that's going to mean that my engine is going to live a long and healthy life. Uh, yes to a degree, sure you're probably unlikely to end up in a situation where uh, you're going to end up with knock necessarily but what you are going to be doing is creating a huge amount more exhaust gas temperature and particularly with a turbocharged rotary engine uh, that can end up damaging your exhaust components, your turbine wheel etc. Uh, you saw there we were only at 60 kPa, I was only at about 18 or 20 percent throttle and we were seeing the exhaust gas temperature uh, skyrocket past 860 degrees C before I started adding that timing back in. So we do need to strike a happy balance here, we don't want the timing so conservative that we're giving away a huge amount of torque and power and creating very high exhaust gas temperature. We do need to have enough timing in there that we are bringing that exhaust gas temperature under control which is one of the reasons why where possible I do like to have exhaust gas temperature sensors on a rotary engine. Okay, so we'll close down our torque optimization test and we'll have a look at some of the other aspects for uh, the trends in our timing table here. So obviously we've now got this big chunk here that I've just set to 45 degrees. So let's ignore that and look at the other trends. And again, if you've seen these trends in a piston engine before, they really are very, very similar. Remembering here that we've got 200 kPa as our target. From around about four, four and a half thousand RPM where we are on, on full boost, the numbers that we can see here aren't too dissimilar to what I would expect on some piston engines. Uh, 12 to 15 degrees. What we do tend to see again with a rotary engine is as our RPM increases, we don't tend to quite see the increase in timing with that RPM. So we're not going to be chasing uh, the timing up quite as dramatically as we would with a typical piston engine. So the two trends still exist though as we go from low RPM to high RPM we've got less time available for the combustion event to occur so we do tend to see an increase in advance in our timing. Uh, the other trend we've got here in this graph, let's close that down because we don't need that, uh, the other trend we've got in our graph here as we go from low load which is the top of the graph to high load the bottom of the graph where we've got high boost we tend to see the ignition timing retard. This is because we're now packing more fuel and air into the rotor housing. Uh, the combustion speed physically is faster uh, as we increase the load. So again to achieve MBT or at least get our timing, uh, our peak cylinder pressure where we want it to occur, we need to retard the timing. So the two trends again exactly the same as what we see in a conventional piston engine. No difference there. The key is just being conservative with our timing. Uh, and making sure that we are controlling our exhaust gas temperature. Now the other intricacy though when we're talking about ignition timing with rotary engines comes down to the trailing split. So this is uh, an aspect which I know confuses a lot of people with the rotary engine there are two spark plugs per rotor housing. We've got the leading plug which is what is triggered off this main timing table here. So this table defines when uh, the leading plug will fire but then we've got a trailing plug as well. Different ECUs handle this in a different way but the most common way is to use a spark split or trailing split table and the Adaptronic we can find that over here so we'll click on that. Uh, so this is a much simpler table, much smaller with less breakpoints but we still have the same uh, axes, we've got inlet manifold pressure, 
versus our engine RPM. So this simply defines how many degrees of eccentric shaft rotation after the leading plug fires, the trailing plug will fire. And this is another area where a lot of people don't really understand what they should be trying to achieve. I see a lot of people trying to chase power uh, with a trailing split table and the reality is that it can be quite dangerous and it's not really the place where we want to be trying to find power. What we need to understand with this table is that reducing the numbers in this table, reducing the split, or basically having the trailing plug cl fire closer to the leading plug uh, has a very similar effect to overall advancing the timing. So particularly under high load, this can potentially be dangerous. So we wanna be mindful of this. Now the table that I've got here is one that I find works pretty well for just about every rotary engine that I tune. So I don't tend to stray too far away from it. The numbers here have sort of been reverse engineered from uh, some basic uh, mass maps as well as just seeing what works over my career uh, so we've got a slight increase in the trailing split down in the idle areas we're running 15 degrees of split same as factory uh, in the cruise areas in vacuum we've got 10 degrees of split so we reduce that advance that uh, the split a little bit and then uh, on boost I've reduced it down a little bit further to about eight degrees which is about as far as I'd really be comfortable of going the reality is though if you aren't comfortable with this table, you don't know what to do with it, uh, then the safest bet is set the entire table to a value of 10 degrees. It's not quite going to be optimal, uh, but it's gonna be there or thereabouts. It's gonna give you a pretty good result. Uh, so what we'll try and do here, we'll just do a, another uh, quick demonstration here, just for simplicity. I'll just set all of these cells that we're gonna operate here uh, back to 26 degrees. and. Um, Again, hopefully I'm not going to throw Luke too far under the bus with this. We'll just get into the middle of this cell here. And what we want to do this time is use the little red torque graph here on our mainline dyno. So this is plotting our torque in real time. So we can see that that red line's moving around a little bit, but uh, pretty much consistent as long as I stay in the same cell. So what we want to do here is now come over to our, our rotary split. So we can see that at the moment the rotary split there is 10 degrees. I am interpolating a little bit. So let's just try setting that rotary split to 15 degrees. But what I want to do, have a pressed enter yet so that change hasn't taken place just look at that red line there on our graph and trying to mentally sort of average the small oscillations we'll see I press enter realistically zero difference let's try advancing that so we'll go from 15 degrees to 8 degrees so let's just try and get back in the center of the cell you can see that the numbers just skyrocketed there but we'll just wait for that to get consistent not very consistent there we go and we'll press enter and again we see essentially no change there so the trailing plug is not there so much as a power plug it's not about the power uh, it's about completing what's left of the combustion process uh, theory goes here that 95% of the combustion process is completed by the leading plug uh, the trailing plug is there to just finish off what's left of that combustion yes there can be some power in this uh, it's also an emissions consideration there as well so uh, those are the factors there that we need to consider with our trailing and plug don't go chasing power with that be mindful of reducing the numbers too far if in doubt an across the board value of 10 degrees is going to be uh, safe all right we're going to move into questions really shortly uh, so if you have any questions I can see we've already got a bunch of them there yeah. if you've got any more please keep them coming uh, the last demonstration I want to do or the last thing I want to talk about here is staged injection because uh, this is another peculiar aspect to the rotary engine now yes staged injection of course does exist on piston engines but uh, it's a little bit less common definitely your garden variety piston engine off the showroom floor is unlikely to have staged injection whereas the rotary engine uh, is guaranteed to have staged injection so why do we have this uh, well it's about the fact that uh, we've got less time available to get the fuel injected uh, plus we've got two rotors so if we have one injector per rotor housing uh, that's going to make it even more difficult to have an injector that's sized sufficiently to, to uh, keep the engine happy under high RPM, high load, but still give good idle quality. So uh, let's just jump back into the software here for a moment, and what we'll do is we'll start by coming across to our fuel system and our injector type. So uh, here we've got our primary and our secondary injectors that we can uh, define. 
here we've got uh, an ID injector Dynamics 1300cc primary injector uh, and for a secondary injector ID 1700 as well. You can choose most of these from a drop down menu making your life a little bit easier and this just gives full characterization data to the ECU of those injectors that's really important for uh, the volumetric efficiency based fuel model to work properly as well as the staged injection so this really becomes a bit of a case of garbage in garbage out if you can't give good quality data around the injectors uh, you are likely to find that the staged injection as well as the rest of the fuel model isn't going to work properly uh, or at least not as well as it can do all right, so once we've got our stage in our injector setup done, we'll come back over here and we've got uh, our main fuel map, which we've already looked at. Uh, we've got our injector staging out here. So let's have a quick look at that. So injector staging there. And the Adaptronic, of all of the ECUs that I've used over the years, uh, I think it's fair to say that the Adaptronic probably does the most seamless job of staged injection, which is great from our perspective because it leaves us with very little work to do. Uh, but let's go over it. So what we've got here is the number of stages of injection that are available. So we've obviously got two here. Uh, off the top of my head, I think the Adaptronic can do up to four stages of injection provided you've got a sufficient injector drive. So suitable, obviously, for very high power uh, rotary drag engines for example and then the other key parameter we've got available here is the minimum off time for stage one now this is a roundabout way of essentially defining what the maximum duty cycle for the stage one injectors will be now it's not quite injector duty cycle because uh, this defines as its name implies the amount of time that the primary injector must be off before it can switch on for its next, next injection cycle uh, so of course two milliseconds off time becomes a variable target in terms of injector duty cycle uh, depending on the rpm that that's occurring at but uh, we find with this i think off the top of my head it hit about 90 percent injector duty cycle and as the rpm increases it sort of drops back a little bit so yeah we're probably sort of there or thereabouts of what i'd want to run okay so that's the, as simple as it is and basically for a turbocharged rotary engine where our aim is to get as much fuel into the engine as we need it's all we need to do. Uh, the other aspect we've got a, the ability to adjust here is our two stage injection map so we'll have a look at this not a lot to see as we can see here we've got a three dimensional table uh, inlet manifold pressure versus RPM numbers in this table though are all set to zero so uh, pretty simple there numbers in this table basically define what percentage of the fuel will be delivered through the secondary injectors so numbers of zero here mean that all of the fuel will be delivered through the primary injectors if we leave this table like it is set up now though what is going to happen is that the Adaptronic ECU is just going to uh, automatically run the uh, primary injectors as hard as they can or as hard as it can up to the point where the it hits that two millisecond off time limit and once it gets to that point then it's going to start gradually and smoothly staging in the secondary injectors so uh, from our perspective again no work to do it all happens automatically in the background and it's really really nice and seamless on the other hand you may want to use this map in a different way uh, it may be that you want to maybe you're running an engine where you've got uh, high low injection with injectors fitted down there the inlet valves on a piston engine and another set out of the inlet trumpets which you want to stage a hundred percent onto uh, at high rpm well then you can start manipulating the numbers in this table to achieve exactly what you want but for our purposes uh, really seamless so what we'll do here uh, is we'll just have a quick dyno run uh, so that we can see how this all works. Now I have been having some trouble as well, I will apologise with uh, our CAN bus on this car at high RPM uh, is giving some uh, very weird uh, sort of data for our Lambda so we're probably going to see that our Lambda trace actually isn't going to be that smooth and nice during this ramp run but let's head across to the dyno screen. On the top you're going to see inlet manifold pressure, I've got a reference line in there at 200 kp or 15 psi I've got our lander plot in the middle as I say expect to see that look a little bit uh, erratic uh, target in there at 0.78 and then of course our power down the bottom so let's get a run underway and we'll have a look at what our injections doing uh, after this run Yeah, 
as I expected, uh, doesn't look that pretty, but uh, I can guarantee you that my Lambda is a little bit more on target than that. So 386 kil uh, horsepower for that particular run. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll go into our laptop software again and we'll have a quick look here in our log viewer. Uh, this is not my favourite feature of the Adaptronic ECU, I find it uh, a little bit clunky to use. Uh, and am I actually going to be able to see this data? Um, no, maybe not. It's not particularly helpful. Alright, uh, without spending a little bit more time manipulating this, I don't think I'm actually going to be able to show you what I wanted, which was the uh, injector duration uh, for our primary and secondary, but it's probably not going to help as well because uh, my air fuel ratio plot uh, data on the uh, the ECU is going to look just as ugly. So you don't have to take my word for it. Basically what I wanted to show you here was a data log where we can see the primary injector duty cycle coming up or in this case uh, injection pulse width will come up uh, and it hits uh, the point where it maxes out uh, and then it drops away and we see that secondary duty cycle, secondary injection pulse width come in and we would see over that course uh, absolutely no change in our lambda. It's basically completely seamless so you can't really see if we're just looking at the lambda plot uh, any discrepancy in the lambda that actually uh, indicates that the secondary injection is working as I say just seamless so unfortunately uh, not the best demonstration there but uh, I do apologize normally what I do because I'm not a big fan of the Adaptronic uh, logger software uh, I do export this into a .csv and then analyze it in mega log viewer I find that uh, a much quicker uh, and more effective way of analyzing the log files but uh, I'm not going to do that right here but you'll have to take my word for it anyway that brings us to the end of our lesson there so hopefully that's debunked a few of those myths or misconceptions that you may have had with rotary engine tuning for now we'll get into our questions uh, and remember if you've got any more see uh, please keep asking them um Speedness has asked, oh, it would be good if I could share the choice of sensors, part numbers and manufacturers on the HPA RX-7, component list provided under the club level wiring course is outdated when compared to the current state of the HPA RX-7. Uh, yeah, you probably did right there. Uh, things did move on a little bit from when this was fitted with that club level, um, club level harness. Uh, probably not much point me sitting here spouting off parts and numbers here but uh, what I might do after this is uh, put a post in our forum that you can have a, have a look at there which will explain everything. There's nothing particularly out of the ordinary that we're using on here, just the usual sort of parts that you would expect in terms of pressure sensors etc. Uh, Brendan has asked, I guess this might be a good time to ask, compared to piston engines and how you can't reuse head gaskets, bolts and stuff, how are rotaries when it comes to reusability of seals, tension bolts, etc? Uh, good question, Brendan. I don't build rotary engines. That is one thing I have not delved into as yet. Uh, so I can't really speak for those as such. Uh, I do know a number of people who do, do build rotary engines. Uh, and seals, uh, for the likes of the side seals, etc., O-rings, etc., I should say, uh, those generally you would replace when you rebuild the engine. Uh, it depends on the condition of other things like your apex seals and your actual side seals on the side of the rotors. But again, uh, I'm not a rotary builder. It, so probably not the best person to ask that question to. Uh, Levithan Magic has asked, how does porting affect idle control and power band on a turbo and naturally aspirated rotaries? How does it affect part throttle as well? Uh, okay, so this is a really big question because so much of it's going to depend on specifically what porting you're talking about. Uh, there's a much big, uh, there's a, a very big difference in different porting techniques between the likes of a, uh, a mild extend port or even a bridge port compared to a peripheral port. Peripheral port being the hardest to tune part throttle drivability and control on a peripheral port is basically diabolical the overlap is so dramatic uh, so basically the peripheral port is really only useful at high RPM uh, and wide open throttle uh, well that's where it really comes to life when it say it's only useful but that's where it really sort of comes into its own uh, basically 
any porting is going to require a higher target idle speed uh, and generally because of the overlap as well you're not getting a true indication of the actual air fuel ratio reading uh, so it's a little difficult to give a specific target air fuel ratio and this is one of the areas much like tuning the non-ported rotary like ours here it's a case of choosing a target air fuel ratio or displayed air fuel ratio uh, that's going to give good idle manners so it's a case of just experimenting there and you want to run on the leanest range of the air fuel ratios that are being uh, demonstrated where the idle quality is good. So I'm sorry it's not probably a, a very all encompassing answer there but there are just so many variations in between. Uh, it is asked can you please explain injection angle on a rotary engine and the effects of it uh, so yeah very similar to fuel injection angle on a piston engine it's about trying to time the injection pulse so that we can take the best uh, best use of that that way the fuel is being injected and being delivered uh, so it's probably actually easier to talk about in terms of uh, piston engine because we talked there about open valve and closed valve injection it's kind of similar with a rotary engine but it's open port and closed port injection. Basically what's going to happen when the fuel is injected? Is it going straight into the rotor housing or is it going to have to wait for the next engine cycle? On face value you might think that timing the injection to occur uh, when the port is open would make the most sense. Uh, and in some instances you can find your results better when you do that. Uh, however what you're then doing is relying on the atomization of the fuel to allow it to be combusted easily and while uh, face value you might think that the fuel atomization is great it actually pales into insignificance compared to if we inject against a hot uh, intake runner wall uh, the fuel is going to actually essentially vaporize off that hot wall and then it's going to be ingested in a vapor form which is much easier to burn so uh, sometimes closed valve injection actually gets you better results it's a case of experimenting to see how, how the particular engine uh, actually performs. Uh, what we're looking for essentially is either a change in torque as we vary our injection timing or more often what we'll actually find is that as we change our injection timing uh, the fuel is being introduced, the same amount of fuel is being introduced but it's in a form that's easier to combust so we actually see our air fuel ratio move richer meaning that we can then remove values from our VE table uh, meaning that we get an economy benefit as well. So uh, the numbers that uh, I am actually running in our engine are very close to stock 13B timing values. Uh, Joey has asked how does uh, one differ the idle tuning on or wide open throttle from a street port to a bridge port okay so basically uh, answer that question there so we're going to need uh, to increase our idle speed appropriately so this being a stock engine I'm idling at about 950 to 1000 rpm uh, on a decent sized bridge port probably going to want to idle that engine around about 15 to even 1800 rpm uh, Rusty Rotors has asked, can you demonstrate the power difference with the trailing ignition disabled? Uh, no, I can't easily hear, uh, but it is a good test. Um, the uh, the test that we do there, uh, with a rotary engine in particular, because you've got the two spark plugs per rotor housing, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to actually pick up uh, a misfire. So uh, a good test there is to disable the trailing plug. And uh, if, you're, if you've got your leading firing, you're probably going to find that your power will only drop off marginally. As I mentioned, most of the, uh, the combustion process uh, does get ignited off or uh, lit off by the leading plug. Uh, you're only going to see a small discrepancy by disabling the trailing plug. Uh, AX75 has asked, I thought minus 20 was trailing uh, so minus 20 is trailing uh, I'm not sure if you're getting confused there so uh, the, the timing that the adaptronic produces in the rotary mode will be minus 5 on the leading minus 20 on the trailing but because we only have the minus 20 mark on the FD RX7 there is only one mark it is at minus 20 which means we can only check the timing properly on the trailing uh, again I'm not 100% sure if that was the angle of your question there on the earlier we have two marks uh, one for leading at minus 5 one for trailing uh, at minus 20 um, Mind Block has asked uh, at wide, wide open throttle what's the max EGT to be safe I was thinking 1250 Air Force 676C uh, 
So no, on a rotary engine you're going to be much, much, uh, rich, uh, much, much hotter than that. Rotary engines in general are going to be hotter anyway. Uh, would be on a turbocharged rotary engine, uh, you're likely to be seeing EGTs easily in the range of 900C. So uh, I try and cap it out there. Sometimes uh, we are going to end up even seeing it exceed that. Depends, of course, on how much power you are producing, how much boost you are running as well. Uh, 670 to 700C, that'd be pretty conservative even for a turbocharged piston engine, to be honest. Um, uh, Speedness has asked, uh, I've calculated I need around 7,200 cc's of fuel for my power goals on my FDRX7 on E85. Based on this I'm looking at a pair of ID1050 primaries and a pair of uh, ID2600 secondaries. Any drawbacks tuning wise, keep in mind I'm running smaller primaries and larger secondaries. Uh, not really, I mean the staging really comes into this as well, but uh, the way the adaptronic works, and obviously I have no idea what ECU you're running, uh, the adaptronic works really well because it's running the primaries out as hard as it can before it starts bringing in the secondaries, so uh, the, you can get a problem if you've got a really big difference between the primary size and the secondary injector size, where as you stage in the secondaries you're sort of running right down on the minimum pulse width that the secondaries can run, and that can give you problems with fuel control. Control. Uh, I would imagine as long as you're careful with your injector staging, if you're not using the Adaptronic, that shouldn't be a problem. We've seen, of course, uh, some pretty big advances in uh, injector quality these days and what we can get away with uh, with the injectors that are on the market these days are very, very different to what we could have done with the technology that was available sort of 10 years ago. That being said, I have not personally yet used the ID2600, so I can't speak from experience. Um, we've got a few questions here on fuel changes, AFR and timing targets. Not limited on Jägermeister's asked, if you premix your fuel, will change in pr changes in premix to gas ratio from tank to tank affect the tune? Uh, certainly not if you're within at least a moderate realm of being accurate with your premix. I mean on this we are running uh, 150 mils of premix per 20 litres. So uh, you're going to have to make a significant change to your premix uh, values in order to really affect the fueling. So uh, this really just comes down to being accurate with your premix though. You want to make sure that you stay on your target premix anyway. Uh, AX, AX75 F92, probably the most complex name here today to say easily, thanks for that, has asked when we transition from to E85 how will your AFR and timing targets change? Okay, uh, so I don't really chase power with the timing on E85, well on E85 we will be much less knock prone, uh, we're probably going to be finding that uh, a couple more degrees would be about as much as I would use, uh, if I want more power I'd be chasing that with a little bit more boost rather than timing. On E85, because of the cooling nature of the fuel as well as the higher effective octane rating, if anything we can target a little bit leaner than what we'd run on pump gas. We simply uh, don't need to rely on the rich fuel targets in order to uh, keep the engine happy. So I wouldn't be uncomfortable running a little bit leaner on E85, but I'd only be marginally leaner. Uh, Ed has asked how much more timing would you add when moving to a fuel like methanol? Good question there, uh, back in my earlier days I did tune quite a number of methanol drag engines and it's not like a piston engine, again uh, the rotary engine much less sensitive to timing with its power, uh, so there what I would tend to do, you probably find that the engine is basically going to tell you what it wants but uh, you'll probably find that the engine won't actually want a significant increase in timing uh, moving from from uh, pump gas to methanol. Some of that timing change does come from the fact that methanol is a slower burning fuel, but again, uh, really one of the changes, one of the reasons we go to methanol is to support uh, much more boost and that's where our power is going to come from. Uh, Cody has asked if you had to choose rotary or piston. Well, I did and we chose both. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. Our Gold members are able to watch these live and ask questions and get answers while we're presenting. 
After the webinars have been hosted live, they're added into our webinar archive where our Gold members can re-watch them at their leisure. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. This is one of the fastest ways to expand your knowledge on a wide range of topics as well as to stay up to date with the latest tools, trends and techniques in the performance industry. Our Gold members also get access to our private members only forum which is the best place to get fast answers to your specific questions. Gold membership can be purchased for just 19 US dollars per month, however you'll also receive 3 months of free access with the purchase of any of our courses. Click the link in the description to learn more.